Welcome to the Transforming Trauma Podcast. Transforming Trauma is presented by the Complex Trauma Training Center. I'm your host, Emily Ruth, and I'm so glad you've joined us today. As a mental health professional, you care for others, and the Complex Trauma Training Center is committed to caring for you. We are thrilled to introduce our Space Program 2025, an inner development program of support and self-discovery for therapists on the personal, interpersonal, and transpersonal levels. Therapists often focus so much on learning skills to use with clients that we don't leave space for ourselves. This interactive experiential program offers an immersive learning environment designed to cultivate space for ourselves in our professional role. As Viktor Frankl taught, between stimulus and response, there is a space. In that space is our power to choose our response. In our response lies our growth and our freedom. Starting February through December 2025, we will host six online sessions designed to cultivate space for self-care and self-discovery. We will be exploring the obstacles that stand in your way of being the most present, heartful, and effective therapist possible. Together, we will explore in a safe, inclusive, and supportive environment with the intention to create greater effectiveness and resilience in our professional lives. Please visit ComplexTraumaTrainingCenter.com and secure your spot in the SPACE program. It's time to care for you. And now for our interview. Dr. Jonathan Shedler is a psychologist known internationally as an author, consultant, researcher, and clinical educator. Dr. Shedler's research and writings are shaping contemporary views of personality styles and their treatment. He is author of over 100 scientific and scholarly articles, creator of the Shedler Weston Assessment Procedure for Personality Diagnosis and Clinical Case Formulation, and co author of the Psychodynamic Diagnostic Manual. He has over 25 years' experience teaching and supervising psychologists, psychiatrists, and psychoanalysts. Please enjoy this conversation with Dr. Jonathan Shedler. All right, Dr. Jonathan Shedler, welcome back. Hello. It's good to be back. Yeah, it's so good to have you, and and thank you for taking the time to be here. In our last conversation, you shared some some of the defining characteristics of good psychotherapy. And we talked about the widening chasm between research conducted by academic psychologists and then real life psychotherapy. We talked about a therapeutic alliance and countertransference. We covered a lot of territory last time. We did. We covered a lot of ground. <laughs> and there was so much more I wanted to talk about. So we wanted to bring you back and we're just so grateful that you were willing to. Thank you. I would love to ask you, you know, what your hope is for our listeners during our time together. What would you like for them to come away with? Well, my understanding is listeners are primarily psychotherapists or perhaps psychotherapists in training. I'd like to help other therapists understand what really good psychotherapy looks like. And if they're doing really good psychotherapy, is getting undermined from all sides. You know, health insurance companies don't really like, you know, don't really like what I would call meaningful psychotherapy. We get a lot of bad press or attack from academic psychologists who want to tell us that, you know, what they call manualized therapy and what we could call assembly line therapy, eight to 12 sessions of, you know, very brief treatment conducted by following a a standardized protocol. You know, therapists are hearing that this is the way to do therapy. So anyway, what I'd ideally like is for listeners who are doing what I think meaningful therapy to feel confident about the value of this kind of therapy. And for people who perhaps are learning or groping their way in that direction, we need to encourage people in the, in the direction of doing more meaningful psychotherapy. Mm-hmm. It's a Beautiful intention. Thank you. So you've talked a lot in the work that you've put out. I know in social media, you've discussed how we identify and work with personality disorder patterns and personal agency. I mean, just I would say personality patterns, not necessarily personality disorders. This is actually an important point, so it's a good opportunity. You know, everybody in the world, by virtue of being a human being, has a personality. And for most people, most of the time who come to therapy, you know, our our problems aren't encapsulated things, you know, like I came down with this case of depression or anxiety or bulimia, Mm -hmm. right? They're rooted in 
the fabric of our personality and the fabric of our lives. Right? So it's not about personality disorders. Right? It, it's about understanding a person's difficulties in the larger context of who we are as people. So everybody has a personality style, personality patterns. It's just universally true. Hmm. Thank you for that. It isn't that small, actually, as you start talking about it. I can see that that's actually a really important. Well, because if you say personality disorder, oh, so some people hear it as an affront. Other people think, you know, often rightly so. Well, I, you know, I don't have a personality disorder. I'm struggling with this and that, mm-hmm. you know, like this doesn't really apply to me. And I mean, and they're often correct about that. And this is one of the things actually, sorry, this is a bit of a digression, but yeah. you know, that's really become an issue in the clinical world. We always used to talk about personality and now it's like personality doesn't exist unless we can diagnose it as a disorder. Disorder. I yeah. Don't think is, you know, don't think is a helpful way to look at things as a clinician. Yeah. I really appreciate you saying that. There's actually a conversation I was having with someone and ADHD came up and this person was like, you know, I don't mind the ADH part. <laughs> it's the it's the D at the end that I don't, it's like it's tough for me to like connect with that. So I don't know if that feels relevant to you, but even just that conversation, I think, is is naming. Well, it, it does feel relevant because, the, you know, so the DSM, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, mm-hmm. in the form that we're familiar with it, came about, I think it was in 1980. And the architects of that really, really wanted to treat mental health and psychiatry as a branch of medicine. Right? So they had a, a diagnostic manual of disorders. Everything had to be framed as a disorder. And that was actually a very, very sharp break with how psychotherapists really understood things. Like, you know, you're struggling with depression, or you feel anxious or shy in social situations, or you know, there's a way that you get in your own way or trip, you know, trip over your own feet mm-hmm. in life. Or recreate the same, find yourself living out the same patterns over and over again. I mean, th- this is the language of psychotherapy. And then they superimposed the word disorder. Mm-hmm. Right? Uh, so we, what we could say is, here's a compendium of difficulties that you know of the sort that bring people to treatment, and superimposing the word disorder on it necessarily helps things. And Pretty much everything in there, even though the DSM approaches things categorically, right? You have this or you don't, you're in this category or not. Like, actually, that doesn't map on to reality. The reality is that pretty much everything in the DSM is really a, a continuum or a spectrum. You know, you're not, you know, you're depressed or you're fine, right? That you're somewhere in a continuum of. Hmm how much you're struggling with depression and what that means. So, you know, there's a lot of ways that the DSM has actually not facilitated sophisticated clinical thinking for therapists Mm -hmm. or for patients for that matter. Yeah. Well, and I, I feel like one of the things I've heard you talk a bit about is this, well, just the piece around knowing ourselves. And if we're framing it as like, okay, we're we're looking for disorders. Who wants to who wants to know yourself better if you're like looking for a disorder? So I don't know. I I appreciate this this way that you're holding it. It just makes it feel more open and accessible, especially for folks who the, going to therapy for the first time is, can be really terrifying. I mean, yeah, I've had a lot of clients say just just picking up the phone, just emailing you was terrifying to me. Absolutely, and sometimes we as therapists don't realize. Just what a major, you know, significant life, you know, step to take it is for some people just to call us. Yeah. Well, thank you. I appreciate your passion behind the little side roads that we take sometimes. <laughs> That's great. So I'm really curious about your take on how personality patterns play out in the social <laughs> dynamics out in the world. <laughs> That's kind of like, can not be really not to bring up a ginormous, <laughs> you know, <laughs> ginormous topic. Not exactly a, a little bite-sized yeah, soundbite yeah, here. Yeah, you know, I aim high. <laughs> <laughs> well, say some more about what you're thinking about. And- yeah. One of the things I've really been thinking about these last few years is that I feel like 2020, there was kind of this mark 
this like milestone, at least for me, how I see it is like things got really polarized. I mean, in lots of different areas. And so I'm not just talking about just politics or just this or just that, but there's a lot of ways that we miss each other's humanity. There's so much division and yeah. you're with me or you're against mm-hmm. me or, you know, you're in my group and on the side right. of the good guys or you're not in my yes. group and, you know, you're one of the bad guys, you're a villain. Right. Right. And I don't know, sometimes it feels like, and I'm not saying I'm like exempt in all this. Like I feel, I've found myself kind of be, pu- be pulled in different directions and, and trying to really look at myself around that. So maybe this question is really, it's a personal question. Mm-hmm. I'm really genuinely wanting to understand, but it, sometimes it feels like there's this unbridled hatred or is there, you know, narcissism that can sometimes feel disguised as righteousness or kind of a moralistic, yeah. you know, take. I would love to hear you talk a little bit more about some of these larger social issues through a psychoanalytic lens. Well, yeah. I'll start with a true story. It's funny you're asking me this. I literally just just came from a class teaching some uh, psychoanalytic candidates, trainees. <laughs> and like, mm. This issue really came up about how certain kinds of personality patterns that we are familiar with clinically are seem to be playing out on a societal level. But let me yeah. tell you a story. I was a grad student at the time, and I was shadowing a, a psychiatrist, basically sitting in on his interviews with, with patients. And we met with a patient. The diagnostic picture was very, very confusing. He was referred for this psychiatric interview evaluation to try to figure out whether or not he had a psychotic disorder. Right? The thought disorder. It was really confusing, and I was really eager to see. I, mean, I was just a beginner. I was a student. You know, how is this expert psychiatrist going to go about it? And the issue is all of the things that raised questions about this patient's thought process were couched around religion. That he was part of a fundamentalist religious community, and a lot of the things he was talking about was, you know, he would talk to God. And there was a way that he would describe this, though, where it was very, very unclear. Was he having auditory hallucinations? (laughs) Or this is the way people in his particular religious community spoke. But of course, you know, most of the people who said they're speaking to God are referring to their own thoughts and, you know, their own words. And maybe they have a feeling of a God listening or responding in some way. They're not having auditory hallucinations hearing right. a voice. <laughs> they're not hearing the voice of God. Yeah. So I was like kind of on the edge of my seat of, oh, like, how do you resolve this? And then I read the psychiatrist's report, you know, his assessment report. And he basically said, it's impossible to tell. I don't know whether this person is having psychotic hallucinations or delusions or whether he's describing things that are you know, pretty normative in, in his particular culture. Right? You can't tell, at least on the basis of that one interview alone, you can't tell. What they came away from with that is what I thought like an insight that, that I think has you know stood me in pretty good stead throughout my entire career, which is psychopathology finds camouflage, right? That if you're not really glued together very well, if you have some kind of you know pretty serious personality problem, what you're likely to do is to gravitate toward a belief system, a community, a subculture that normalizes it, right? And then you say, you know, I'm not crazy. I don't have, you know, problems. Like, this is the way to think about things, right? We find camouflage. And I think there's a certain amount of that going on in the culture. You know, people have causes, and they get righteous about their causes. And I think it has to be true, right? Right? So there are some people who are very active and with respect to wanting to bring about constructive social changes, you know, right wrongs, address real problems, who are coming from a place of genuine care and compassion and a desire to contribute in some way, right? To make 
some needed changes that <laughs> so that we can be better off, we mm. people, all of us. But when a, movements or causes gain a certain momentum, they become a culture in their own right, they easily become hiding places right, to camouflage pretty severe problems. You know, like the patient I you know, met with with the psychiatrist, you know, so many years, decades ago, I ended up coming to think that he probably was seriously psychotic. We did found a community that, that, that sort of masked that and gave him an entire way of talking about his experience, right, where he didn't stand out as like, oh my God, his, you know, his, his thinking is disordered. He has delusions. He has hallucinations, right? He found a place where he could fit that, that masked the extent of his pathology. When we talk about personality, okay, now we can use the word personality disorders because okay. right, at a certain at a certain point, you know, you have so much interpersonal difficulty, so much impairment in your ability to have mutual rewarding relationships. What I mean by that is relationships that are a two way street that work for two people that are based on a genuine connection and attachment and mutual understanding. Right? At a certain point, there is so much impairment in that. And in some of the personality disorders, so much aggression, hostility, sadism, cruelty, right? desire to harm, right? that it has to be the case that a certain number of people find their way into causes that become camouflage for some, you know, really pretty serious pathology. And if you're somebody who's filled with hate, looking for any excuse to attack someone else, to denigrate somebody else, you know, to set out to harm them, to harm their lives, to destroy their careers, that's what you're about because that's how you are put together psychologically. It's pretty hard to go out in the world and say, well, I'm a I'm a malignant narcissist and I derive joy and pleasure from hurting people. Right? I think you would likely be drawn, you know, to a cause or a movement that provides a built-in justification for that. Right? And now you're not acting out of cruelty or aggression or sadism. You're acting from a place of righteousness. In fact, you're the good guy. They're the bad guy. So when I wrote about personality problems, find camouflage, that's the sort of thing I was talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sitting with that right now. <laughs> <laughs> Noticing I'm having kind of my own, yeah, my own experience as you talk about that. You want to say or <laughs> not so much? I don't, but I do. <laughs> <laughs> This is what we call ambivalence. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, here's what I'll say. I think as someone who, I, in my experience, I feel like I've been on the other side of that. You mean the other side of that? You mean you've been the target of that? Yeah. Or you mean you've been, mm. Yeah. Sorry, we'll but I think all, this out. <laughs> I, but I think a lot of people are having the experience of being on the wrong side of those kinds of, the wrong side of those kinds of attitudes and the wrong side of, what often is a very personal attack. Yeah. And I do, I feel like there's so many ways that people can hide behind screens. Yeah. And that, that that comes out in ways that 50 years ago, it didn't come out quite the same way, I don't think. Well, I think that one thing that's changed, I don't know, in the great sweep of history, but certainly in my lifetime, is you know people are doing things that are really pretty antisocial, pretty hostile and aggressive and it used to be you know that the culture the larger culture worked to rein that in you know you you this was not behavior that was you know socially approved of you wouldn't get praise and recognition and social capital for it you know you would get called out there would be social consequences and repercussions, right? I mean, your social group around you mm -hmm. and the culture around you would act to rein in some of the worst excesses. Say, this isn't okay. These are not our values. This is not how we treat one another. What I think has, 
I think I've seen change over the course of my lifetime, it may have a lot to do with social media and the, the fragmenting effects of social media. But no matter what you do, you know, how badly you treat someone, you can find a, a community or you know, a, a subculture that will rally around you and cheer you on for it. Whereas in the past, the, the, the culture worked to sort of restrain or attenuate some of our, what would you say, our worst personality impulses. It, it seems like now that there's a way that something is happening in the culture that works to amplify it. Yeah. I heard you quote, and I can't remember who it was, but it's the quote about the line drawn on the heart that we all have good or bad. Alexander Sol- Solzhenitsyn. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I'm I'm paraphrasing because I don't remember the exact quote, but he said something to the effect that the line between good and evil runs through every human heart. And this is a fundamental, fundamental insight of psychoanalysis. We're human. You know, humans are complex, nuanced, multifaceted. We live in shades of gray, with maybe rare exceptions. You know, there are very, very few saints among us, and there are very few pure villains. We all, I mean, this is one of the core insights of psychoanalysis. We all have the capacity to do harmful things, to hate, to be cruel, right? to hurt other people. We have the capacity to love and care for other people and connect with other people, and find intimacy. We have the capacity to love, and we have the capacity to hate, and that is true of every human being. And I think what the quotation, the Solzhenitsyn quotation was about, is we have to recognize that in ourselves. When we recognize that, when we understand, when we're in touch, you know, with our own capacity to, to harm, you know, and our own, our own not particularly admirable motives, then we have some conscious choices about which parts of ourselves we want to act on and where and how. And, and the, the harm the, at a personal level and at a societal level, when we are not aware of our own capacity to hate, to harm, to be cruel, to be weak, to be vulnerable, right? all the things none of us like to think and feel about ourselves, when we're not in touch with those parts of ourselves, then the overwhelming danger is what we don't know about ourselves. We tend to act out, live out in the world with other people. So this thing that's going on in the culture, you know, like, you know, there's good people who are on the right side of things, and there's bad Mm -hmm. people who are on the wrong side of things from a psychological point of view, is, is a very very psychologically immature and primitive way of, of functioning. Yeah, I like holding it like that. Like it's an undeveloped way of walking through the world when we see things so black and white. And I must be right and you must be wrong. Yeah, and what we're really talking about, because the truth is, you know, we all have good and bad inside of us. We all have the capacity to do good, and we all have the capacity to do evil. That's the human condition. But what we're talking about here really is a form of dissociation or splitting. I mean, it used to be associated with a very particular kind of personality disorder, but now we're seeing it, I think, as a kind of a cultural phenomenon. So the dissociation is, I'm not aware of the destructive, hateful, cruel parts of myself, right? That's dissociated, or, you know, to use the more psychoanalytic term, you know, it's a form of, of splitting, right? Which is, I guess, a way of saying compartmentalizing, right? It's not we're good and bad both, or we have the capacity for both. We are either good or we are bad, right? That mm-hmm. kind of compartmentalizing, that kind of dissociating good feelings, experiences, perceptions from bad ones. And see, when we dissociate the harmful and the destructive parts of ourselves, where do they go? (laughs) You can't just erase, (laughs) you know, you can't erase Mm -hmm. 
motives, impulses, experience, they get dissociated. They tend to get projected onto other people. And those other people, right, we now attribute to those other people all of the horrible qualities that you know we can't accept in ourselves. And we start to see the other person you know, as the repository of evil. Right? But it's actually projection. The hateful, harmful, cruel impulses come from inside of us. They're dissociated. We don't recognize that we're not in touch with those parts of us. They get it projected onto someone else. And now we can see the other person as hateful. And it's incredibly destructive for humanity. Because once you see the other person as a, as a dangerous villain, then what are you justified in doing? You're justified in attacking them. Mm -hmm. Not just justified, maybe it's your moral obligation to attack them. Right. You know? And so in the name of, you know, thinking that we're doing something admirable or virtuous, we can be capable of great cruelty. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that, that kind of brings me back to that original piece that I've kind of just been holding of like, how many times do I miss people's humanity? Yeah. Where, where in my life am I seeing things black and white? How can I see all this gray that you're mentioning? Well, it's pretty hard to you know, see things in nuanced and complicated ways when we're feeling threatened. And this brings us, we're moving from cultural things back to therapy. I mean, one of the things that makes it possible to do useful work in psychotherapy, useful work meaning to come to understand ourselves more fully, to know ourselves more deeply, to recognize, recognize and, and ultimately be able to accept our own unpleasant qualities. Right? Our own unpleasant impulses, urges, desires. One of the things that makes it possible to do that work is that it has to take place in a relational context where we don't feel under threat, where you know we can experience a therapy relationship as a safe harbor mm. right? from which it becomes possible to explore our own minds, explore the, own, the corners of our own minds, including the dark corners of our minds. But we have, right, this is really the first job of an effective psychotherapist, is how do we create a secure relational attachment that makes it possible to do the difficult work of looking at parts of ourselves, you know, that we'd prefer not to. Yeah. Well, and I think you're bringing me to another question I wanted to ask you. Sure. Something else I've heard you say or explore is this piece around that there's there's therapists. Well, I'm sure there's many categories, but two of the categories maybe that we're naming is there's therapists who believe you have personal agency and that therapy is really about helping you change. And then there's therapists who believe that you're a helpless victim and that there's external forces and that therapy is kind of about affirming your victimhood. Yeah. That feels related to this piece because you're naming like there's this safe harbor that we're exploring. And so if if the therapist is kind of putting you in this box like you're right you're a victim, you don't have this space to explore what we were just talking about. This those things feel related to me. Yeah. Well, I think they are related. So I've found that it's very difficult to have this conversation. I'm going to have it and I'm going to tell you my thoughts about it. But my experience has been you, you try to express, you know, a piece of something that's true, right? That there's a lot of truths here, right? There isn't one truth, there, there are many truths. We're talking about human beings and our struggles and our suffering. What happens is when you try to talk about nuanced topics, my experience is that other people want to very quickly put you in a box, you know. Oh, you're one of these people. This is what you believe. Mm -hmm. At which point they're no longer actually listening to me or understanding me or even trying to understand me. You know, what they've done is, you know, put me in a box and then they can attribute all kinds of beliefs and intentions and motives to me that usually don't fit. And then they respond, you know, to this box that exists in their head, not to me. So let me, let me try to say this in as nuanced a way as, as I can. Life is really hard. Traumatic things happen to people all the time. We get treated unfairly. We get mistreated. We get abused. 
Some people get horribly abused. You know, I treat people with trauma histories that it's hard to even describe some of the things that people have been through. Right? So it is a fact of life. I mean, we are all victims to a greater or lesser extent of external circumstances over which you know, we have no control. People get abused. It's not like we have a say over certain aspects of the hand that life deals us. But if we're talking about psychotherapy, understanding that that's true, when somebody comes to psychotherapy, there's at least an implicit acknowledgement. It, you know, there's some way that I myself am contributing to my difficulties or perpetuating my difficulties or amplifying my difficulties. This is a psychological treatment. If that's not true, right, if whatever is causing the person's difficulties have nothing to do with who they are as a person, how they function in the world, well, you know, then we might have just tremendous sympathy for this misfortune, but there's not a thing we can do as psychotherapists to help them. The purpose of psychotherapy is to help people change something about themselves that, number one, is causing difficulties for them. Right? Number two is something that psychotherapy could realistically help them to change. And number three is something that they would like to change about themselves. And those three conditions must exist in order to do psychotherapy. There needs to be a shared understanding between the therapist and the patient or the client about that you are here because there is something about who you are and how you're doing things that's causing difficulties for you that don't have to be that way, right? That things could be easier for you. There's something that what you're doing that's making things harder for yourself. And there needs to be a shared understanding between the therapist and the patient that this is so. And the patient, because they come to a therapist, not to a lawyer or a bodyguard or, you know, fill in the blanks, coming to a psychotherapist, right? There's a way that the patient is implicitly saying, you know, I think there's something about me that's making things harder. I would like to understand that. I would like to change something about myself so that my life doesn't have to be so difficult, so I don't have to suffer as much, so there can be more space for intimacy, connection, joy, meaning, fulfillment, so it doesn't have to be filled with so much hardship, suffering pain. If that's not the case, I don't know what we're really doing in psychotherapy. Now, I could think of uh, other things that fall under the broad umbrella we can call therapy that have a different purpose. Right? We could say, well, there's crisis management. The person is falling apart. Can we help the person to weather the storm, get through the crisis? Well, that's a different kind of treatment. Obviously, that has a place, that is a, you know, an element sure. in what we do in therapy. You know, we could talk about somebody with, say, chronic mental illness. They're never going to get better. They're never going to get well. Right? This is the hand that they've been dealt for whatever reason. Can we help them? Right? This is the real meaning of supportive therapy. Mm -hmm. Can we help that person to manage? as best they can, you know, given the handicap that they're up against, right? So maybe I have somebody with a thought disorder, right? A, a psychotic disorder. Can we help them keep their lives together to the extent possible? You know, maybe the goal of therapy is, can we help the person function in such a way that they can avoid another psychiatric hospitalization? That's a perfectly legitimate treatment goal, but that's different from what I'm talking about when I say psychotherapy. What I consider you know, meaningful psychotherapy is psychotherapy aimed at understanding ourselves more deeply, more fully, so that we have the opportunity to do things differently, to change something about ourselves. Right? That's real psychotherapy. It's not a feel-good emotional massage. 
It's not a feel-good, supportive relationship where the therapist says things that make you feel good about yourself, but nothing changes. It's not examining yourself. It's not facing difficult things. It's not doing the hard work. It's a kind of a feel-good massage, I think we could call it. It's not psychotherapy. It's not aimed at change. And if the person isn't interested in change, or we can't as therapists work with them to help them to become interested in changing something about themselves, there's no foundation for doing the work of therapy. Whatever we're doing, we could call it therapy. It's not therapy anymore. We're doing something else. Can you name the three conditions again you said at the beginning? Yeah, that the focus of therapy is that there's something about the person, something about how they go about things, how they, who they are as a person, that is causing difficulties for them. You know? And those difficulties are things that psychotherapy could realistically, you know, hope to change. Because there's a lot of people, I mean, there's a lot of problems. The, where the world is filled with really, really serious problems, mm. right? You know, that you know, our hearts go out to people who are suffering. You know, we'd like to help them, but they're not psychotherapy problems, right? They're not problems that fall in the category of there is something about the person themselves that's creating the difficulties or perpetuating the difficulties or making things harder, right? They're real problems, but they're not problems that we can solve in psychotherapy. So number one, something is wrong that's causing difficulties for the person. Number two, they are things that psychotherapy could realistically help to address. We, we don't set out on a false pretext that we can do something or solve something that psychotherapy really can't solve. You know, and number three, right, it, it's a collaboration. Right? Right? Mm -hmm. Psychotherapy isn't something done to somebody else. It's something that two people do together with one another by choice, by free choice. So number three, it's something the person wants to change about themselves. Now, yeah. it can often take a lot of work to get to the point where these issues come into focus you know, clearly. Right? The person doesn't necessarily know how they know they're suffering. That's why they came to the therapy. Mm -hmm. They don't necessarily know out of the starting gate you know, how they themselves are contributing to their difficulties. They don't necessarily recognize how they themselves are, you know, say, living out certain kinds of, you know, repetitive self-defeating patterns that are very limiting or that cause them pain. They don't necessarily know that, right? So part of our job as therapists, if that's what's going on, is to help the person to be able to see that, to help the person be able to recognize and understand that. Now they're in a position to make a real decision about, is this something that I would want to change? We have to think together about, it. is this something that psychotherapy could realistically help to change? Is this something I would like to change about myself? And do I want to proceed in psychotherapy on that basis? And sometimes the answer is no. And we have to accept that. Unless there's a shared, you know, a meeting of the minds around a shared purpose of what we're here to do together, it's not going to be real psychotherapy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that piece right there that you named, that's kind of a foundational piece in our training, this idea of like, we have to come to this shared, you know, idea about what it is that we're aiming for. We call it contracting. But, you know, what is it that you're really wanting for yourself in this experience? Yeah, it's a working alliance. And, yeah. and, and contracting is part of a working alliance. But, every, you know, so many therapists misuse the term. So we say thera therapeutic alliance. Actually, the original term is working alliance because it puts mm. the focus on what's the work we're here to do. Mm. Mm -hmm. People think that oh, a therapeutic alliance means, you know, we get along, we like each other, we have good vibes, we feel the connection. That's not what it means. <laughs> right? So there's three pillars of a working alliance, and every one of them is essential, or you don't have a working alliance. Mm -hmm. right? One of them is there's connection, right? You know, you feel a sense of connection, you feel attachment, you feel that the other person, the therapist, gets you, right? You both feel invested enough in the relationship that you want to continue meeting, right? So that's one pillar 
of a working alliance. But a lot of therapists use the term, and they mean only that and nothing else. So let's talk mm -hmm. about the other two pillars. The second pillar is there's a shared understanding and agreement about the purpose of the work. What is it that we're hoping to accomplish here? The third is a shared understanding and agreement about the methods that you're going to use, how you are going to work together in pursuing that purpose, right? So connection, mutual agreement about the purpose of the treatment, mutual agreement about the methods of the treatment. And if you don't have those three elements, you don't have a working alliance, and you don't actually have a basis for doing meaningful psychotherapy. And since we're on the topic, and I see you smile, <laughs> your readers, your <laughs> listeners won't be able to see this, but I see you smiling. There's just to connect the dots and put what we're talking about together. When we say the purpose of the therapy, the purpose isn't to change something about somebody else or change something about the external world. The purpose has to be psychological. It, it has to be something that the person would like to change about themselves that could make life better for them. Right? So, you know, you asked about you know, the issue of, of agency. I mean, part of what we're working toward in therapy, recognizing that we have no control over all kinds of things that happen in the world and happen to us, recognizing that that's so. Can we help the person to feel a greater sense of agency in their own lives, in the areas and to the extent where some greater agency is possible? Because if the person really has no say and no choice about how anything in their life is going, then what are we doing in psychotherapy? Yeah, there's a couple of things that are coming up for me right now. That's why it's hard for me. I don't work with very many kids because <laughs> I want to work with the parents. <laughs> I'm like, the kid doesn't have too much agency right here. I think, anyway, that's a whole nother rabbit hole. Okay, so we talked about the three conditions. You talked about the working alliance. You talked about if we don't have this common agreement about how we're, how we're moving forward, and if the person really doesn't have any agency in the situation, then what, there's nothing we can do as psychotherapists. We need to refer them to someone else that can deal with that. What would that look like for someone listening? And maybe they're not a psychotherapist. Maybe this is just someone who's interested in mental health and they're listening to this podcast. And maybe they're in the client seat. What's something that you could point to that would kind of be a flag or a marker that someone is starting to engage with their own agency in a different way. This really goes back to the very, very beginning of, of, of psychoanalysis and the recognition that, that we don't fully know ourselves, that, that there is such a thing as unconscious mental life. And when parts of our experience aren't accessible to us, for a lot of reasons, they may be defensively warded off the operation of defenses against things mm -hmm. that make us uncomfortable. It may not be defensive at all. It may be that we've never actually, because of how things have gone in our relationships with our caretakers in our early formative years, we may never have developed the capacity to recognize and integrate certain areas of experience. So we're not talking about things that are defended against. We're talking about deficits in the capacity to experience aspects of mental life that points the work of therapy in a whole different direction. Right? But either way, when there are things that we don't know about ourselves and recognize in ourselves, you know, we tend to live them out anyway. Right? I mean, out of sight, out of mind does not mean erased from existence. It means we're not thinking about them. Mm. Right? But we are often living them out, often, you know, to our great detriment. And when we develop increased ability, right, we're talking about coming to learn the, you know, the internal terrain, the, we're talking about mapping the internal terrain, the internal landscape, right, of being comfortable and familiar in our own minds and bodies. And when the things that are going on inside are known and recognizable, then we have choices and options about how we respond, whether and how we express it, versus 
we're not aware of it. We act and respond on the basis of the things that we're not aware of, but we're not aware of it. And then we experience things as happening to us. Okay. So here's a pretty recent clinical example. The patient experiences the world of other people as pretty dangerous. Like Other people have treated him pretty badly, and other people continue to treat him pretty badly. He feels at best, excluded, shut out, like he doesn't matter, people don't care about him, at best, or actively exploited, you know, taken advantage of, manipulated, you know, at worst. That's his experience of the world. But our experience, you know, as the clinician, as the therapist, and in my case, as the supervisor, is of our experience of him is quite different. That our experience is he is doing things in relationships without his awareness, not his conscious intention, that creates barriers between him and other people. So this is his expectation of the world, and without his awareness, there is a way that he makes it a self-fulfilling prophecy. So his experience is people don't care about him, he doesn't really matter to anyone, he's all alone in the world. And at the same time, he interacts with people in a way that keeps them at arm's length, that doesn't let them close, that doesn't let them in, in a way that other people respond to either with indifference, right? So it becomes true. He mm-hmm. doesn't matter to them. Mm-hmm. Or people feel pushed away. Some people push back and become more mm-hmm. aggressive and controlling. That becomes true also. So, you know, what would more agency, greater sense of agency look like for him? Well, for one thing, it would be recognizing, you know, how he is going about things in a way that contributes to recreating these experiences, unpleasant and painful experiences. But out of that understanding comes some choice. Out of that understanding comes the possibility of not having to keep doing things that way, right? Of being able to do things differently. So all of a sudden, I mean, it's not all of a sudden at all, wrong wrong phrase, but that as the person gains insight and begins doing things differently interpersonally, his experience of the relational world starts to change along with his internal changes. And it turns out, right? I mean, some people are going to mistreat you no matter what you do. That's a fact of life. But it turns out that some of the people that he's experienced as not caring, indifferent, controlling, or intrusive, or hostile, some of them don't have to interact with him that way. There's possibilities to have a different relationship. Mm -hmm. And that understanding actually starts in the therapy relationship itself, Mm -hmm. in the transference and the counter-transference, where we don't want to talk about in therapy, you know, what's happening with someone else in another time, in another place, if the something that's happening is happening in the room, in the therapy mm-hmm. session. In right? So where the focus of the treatment, you know, the starting point in the treatment was the ways that he's keeping the therapist at arm's length and treating the therapist in ways that leave the therapist to feel, you know, sort of disengaged and not really wanting to try that hard to be present and be helpful. Mm-hmm. Right? So the therapy relationship becomes a window into certain relationship patterns that are playing out across the person's life, right? Patterns that are playing out in other relationships too. But the therapy relationship is a window into it. That's what we mean when we say we work with transference and Mm counter-transference. Yeah. And I appreciate when I've heard you talk about this, like the way you utilize those reflections of like, I'm noticing in our relationship, there's not much space for me or however you... Yeah. Well, you could say that, sure. But, but that's the, the that's the essence of the work. You know, there's so much misinformation about what a, a psychoanalytic approach to psychotherapy is really about. Some of the misinformation comes from textbooks. You know, like mm-hmm. your college, you know, Psych 101 textbook. Yeah, it doesn't teach you a thing about psychoanalysis. <laughs> it teaches you caricatures of the early history of psychoanalysis from literally the horse mm-hmm. and buggy days, and gets most of that wrong. Right? I mean, this is such misunderstanding. But 
you know, I could say pretty simply, what is the essence of the work? The essence of the work is we don't fully know ourselves. The things that we don't know tend to get lived out in, you know, our patterns and the ways we relate to other people, what we do in our relationships, right? We all have certain relationship patterns that we live out with other people for better or worse. We all live out patterns. Mm -hmm. Therapy is a relationship too. Right? The person brings their patterns with them into the therapy relationship and in one way or another recreates them and the therapist finds themselves a participant in those patterns. And here's where the rubber meets the road, where you just you can either just live out those patterns with a new, different person, but you're going to repeat the same mm -hmm. kind of unhappy relationship. Mm -hmm. Or here is a place to recognize and understand, talk about the patterns as they're arising mm -hmm. in the relationship. So rather than just living them out with yet another person, you are going to live them out with another person too. But ideally, you're not going to do just that. You're going to start to recognize and understand what it is that you're living out. And so come to know those aspects of yourself more fully. And out of that comes freedom and choice to be able to do things differently. And that's the essence of the work. Right? If we attach theoretical terms to it, the patient brings their patterns in. Well, that's transference. The therapist gets pulled into those patterns. And in one way or another, the two people together start you know, living out some pattern. Mm -hmm. Well, the therapist part of that is the countertransference. And the essence of the work is that it's our job as therapists to be able to think about this and understand this, right? So that we can treat it, you know, not as this, oh, you know, here it is happening again. Oh, well, mm -hmm. what can we do? Mm -hmm. But treat it as a source of information that we can use constructively to help the patient to understand themselves differently. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. So I'm mindful of the time. And there was one other area we wanted, I wanted to touch on, and it feels related to even what you're just talking about now, because I know that you have the psych scan. Uh. I wanted you to talk about that because I feel like that is a tool that kind of leaves more space for therapists to do what you were just talking about. Exactly. Yeah. Well, thank you for giving me the opportunity. So yeah. I was involved in creating an assessment tool. It's called psych scan, one word. And it's a little different from other assessment tools. We think about psychological tests. For one thing, it's intelligent. Patients can complete the assessment online in, in less than 10 minutes. But what it actually can do in less than 10 minutes is to assess 11 different DSM disorders right? and over 160 different symptoms. And the clinician gets a clinician report, a computer-generated report that gives them the complete diagnostic picture. You know, If a DSM diagnosis applies, it will indicate that. It will tell you the specific symptoms that the patient is having that led to that diagnosis. It'll give you a comprehensive rate. It's not just, you know, just depression, just anxiety, just eating disorders. It's really a comprehensive picture of the things that therapists are most likely to see in their practice and need to know about upfront. It all happens in less than 10 minutes because it's intelligent. And it, wow. if there's difficulties in a, a certain area, the algorithms probe in as much depth as it takes to sort out what's really going on. And if a person is not having difficulties in a certain area, it doesn't keep asking them irrelevant, <laughs> pointless questions. So it's very user-friendly on the patients or the client's end. They do it all online. The client gets an informational report, you know, no diagnosis. It's not about symptoms. It just, it just highlights problem areas. Mm -hmm. You know, it looks at, I think it's eight different domains of life. And the patient or the client gets an informational report, and that's client oriented information mm -hmm. to sort of empower them to make good decisions about their, you know, mental health care and issues that they can bring into therapy, you know, to bring up and talk about. Mm -hmm. The clinician gets a much more comprehensive diagnostic report. But the value to the clinician, depending on the setting, it does a lot of things, but if we're talking about therapists in, in private practice, is just what you said, that when we see a new patient for the first time, that, that, that initial consultation, we have a lot of heavy lifting to do. And, and some of the things that we have to do are really at cross purposes. So I'm going to be really, I want to set the stage for doing meaningful psychotherapy. The first order of business 
is creating that you know, relational safe base to operate from, right? Creating a working alliance, connecting with the patient, creating a relationship where it becomes possible for the person to speak openly and do this work. But that's completely at cross purposes, right? I also have a professional obligation. I need to understand what the diagnostic picture is. I need to do an examination. I need to ask and inquire about specific symptoms. If there's a safety risk, right? Are they potentially a danger to them to themselves? Are they potentially suicidal? Gotta know that. Is there a violence risk? Might they be dangerous to someone else? Need to know that. Are they bipolar? Might they need a psychiatric referral for medication? We got to know that. So these these two different tasks, right? Connecting with our client and creating a, a working relationship with them, a therapeutic alliance with them, is one task. Doing a comprehensive, you know, assessment or examination, getting the information that we need to like function mm -hmm. competently. And mm -hmm. and not miss something big, not get blindsided right. by it. Right? Those things are at cross purposes. And what Psych Scan does is it offloads that. That you're going to get the comprehensive assessment information. You're not going to miss something. It's going to get that information for you. So it frees you up to use the clinical time to connect with your client or your patient. And it tells you the landscape you're dealing with. Right? It, it kind of gives you the picture up front. These are the important areas where the person's having difficulties or symptoms. You know, it's hard to talk about, therapists talk about this among ourselves, but it's hard to talk about in public, right? But not every patient or client is a good fit for every therapist. Therapists you know, are not prepared to handle certain things, at least in an you know, outpatient private practice setting. And, you know, I see younger therapists doing this all the time that they'll take someone into their practice. They actually don't know what they're getting into. And they've made a commitment to the patient. They have an ongoing relationship. They feel responsible to the patient. And they find themselves in over their heads or dealing with things they're really ill-prepared to, to deal with. And it's actually a terrible situation for the therapist to be in. You know, it, they're not the right person in the right place. And now they feel responsible. So anyway, one of the benefits for therapists in private practice is you know, it can help identify people who are you know, not the right fit for you so that you don't get in over your head and you know you don't get blindsided by something mm -hmm. that you can't deal with down the road and that you can help steer that person to appropriate care up front. So anyway, yeah. yeah. Psychscan.com. Psychscan. I love like what you're saying that it, it creates more space. Yes. That it does the, the heavy lifting or more of the heavy lifting and then we can really focus on that part that that AI can't do. <laughs> no, it can't. <laughs> but yeah, this is a, a wonderful use of artificial intelligence. I really appreciate that you've created this. Yeah, there's a whole team involved in it. Okay, amazing. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, I appreciate that you've been so willing to kind of just, you know, go over all this territory that I'm personally curious about. And I know our listeners will really appreciate the insights and the things that you've shared. As we move to close, I'm curious if there's anything else that you would want our listeners to hear. Oh boy, I important. think we covered a whole lot. <laughs> we did. <laughs> we did. Yeah, I will say one more thing that for your listeners to hear, there is so, so, so much pressure on therapists from multiple corners to compromise what we do in some way, to compromise patient privacy and confidentiality because you know some healthcare system or insurance company or managed care company is asking you for information that actually they have no business having there's so much pressure to compromise you know just creating a meaningful relationship with the person with getting to know them versus you know just sort of offering them generic tools and techniques that, you know, it's like kind of like a menu. You know, if the patient comes in and everybody gets selections from the same menu, I mean, real therapy means really getting to know people as individuals, as individual humans. I guess I would like to tell therapists listening, you know, don't give in to these pressures. People want real psychotherapy. You Speaking of agency, Therapists have a lot more agency often than they realize they have. The most rewarding thing, I think, 
is to do really good work and actually make a meaningful difference in people's lives. I would encourage therapists listening to this who don't give that up. It's a perfect place to <laughs> to end. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate you coming back. Maybe there'll be a, a third installment down the road. <laughs> but yeah, seriously, thank you for taking the time. Thank you for having me. Thanks so much for joining us for today's episode. To find more information about our guest, check the show notes or visit us at complextraumatrainingcenter.com forward slash transforming trauma. You can also connect with us in other ways. We're on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. As a mental health professional, your commitment to healing and growth inspires us. We at the Complex Trauma Training Center are committed to supporting you in your well-being and success. That's why we're honored to invite you to our Space Program 2025, an inner development program of support and self-discovery for therapists on the personal, interpersonal, and transpersonal levels. Running over six online sessions in 2025, this interactive experiential learning program is designed to support self-care and self-discovery for therapists, exploring internally, relationally, and transpersonally. CTTC faculty will welcome you into a professional community of therapists that are seeking to create greater effectiveness and resilience in our professional lives. As CTTC faculty Brad Kammer says, the intent is that this program will help us not only become more effective therapists, but also love our work more. Please visit ComplexTraumaTrainingCenter.com and secure your spot in the 2025 SPACE program. Thanks to Andrea Klunder and the Creative Imposter Studios for producing and editing, to Elisa Sponseller for our album art, and to Brad Kammer for the creation of this podcast. We look forward to building community and connection with you and changing the world by transforming trauma. Mm-hmm.